of us, though, it's amazing and scary at the same time, probably. And so, but God gives us grace. And so I pray that today we will all receive and uh, that, that ministry of reconciliation would be a part of our lives and our hearts as we go from this place. So God is good and we have a good message to share. So, Lord, as we gather here today, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, we pray for a lost, hurt, and dying world around us. We pray for this community. We pray for all of our communities. We pray your Holy Spirit would open doors. We pray for those that are wandering and lost and uh, without hope. This morning, send your spirit, we pray. We ask for your grace over our lives, uh, your wisdom and your counsel. And as our brother shares, Lord, speak to our hearts. Speak, Speak your goodness. Give us courage and boldness to walk and to talk and to speak of who you are. And we thank you for it. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You. All right. Well, good morning. morning. Come on, you can do better than that. Good morning. morning. It's great to be with you. Um, I know most of you here probably don't know who I am, um, despite being a very good, uh, bald-headed-looking guy. Um, My name is Mark Estes, and I'm from Portland, Oregon. Anybody been to Portland before? Two? Okay, I see the glow around your bodies. That's good. Uh, Portland, Oregon, the great Northwest. Uh, Just real quickly, I want to be able to jump right into our stuff, but just give you a little quick background of myself. Uh, First of all, I'm the man of one wife. Isn't that exciting? (laughs) You can listen to me now. You're going, okay, this guy's probably pretty stable. I've been married 42 years, madly in love with my wife. Uh, She is the best-looking lady on planet Earth. You guys can fight over second best, Um, but I love my wife. We have four kids. Um, I have a 42 and a 38-year-old daughter, and we have two boys that we adopted, uh, Spanish Indian developmentally disabled boys, uh, Aaron and Kyle. We love them very much. We got four grandkids. And um, I'm part of a church called Manor House. used to be Bible Temple and then City Bible Church. Been around 71 years. And I have the wonderful privilege of leading a church that's... uh, a legacy church and really reaching the world. And we have a great Bible college. Um, we've got some kids here that go to our Bible college, Portland Bible College. We also have a movement called Manny House Global Movement of Churches. And I have one of the greatest leaders on the planet with me. Seth, why don't you stand? Seth runs all of our global stuff. Put your hands together for Seth. And uh, today we are going to talk about sharing our faith. But in order to start the day, I know it's Saturday morning, it's gray, it's drizzly. I thought I would get your brains working. And so I need you to participate with me. This is going to require a little bit energy on your part. So I need you to do something with me. Don't talk out loud, just use your brain. And I need you to pick a number between one and nine, and it can't be one or nine. I know this is difficult. It's Saturday morning. There's only a few numbers left. Does everybody have a number? Wave at me. No, wave at me. That's most of you. Good. So I need you to take the number that you have chosen, and I need you to multiply it by the number nine. I know, I know this is a stretch now. It's New York, and your number should be double digits. Okay, so someone have a number? I'm just trying to help you make this real easy. So you got a new number in your head. Come on, wave at me. So you got a new number. Now I need you to take those two digits and add them together. So if it's a 33, you're going to have six, right? So you add those two. You got, you got a new number? Yes. Now, thank you. Let's go. Man, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stand right here. We're, you and I are going to have a great time. So you got a new number. Subtract the number five off of your new number. So you got another number. Now, I need you to convert that number to a letter. So like if it's three, A, B, C. If it's a four, A, B, C, D, right? So you got a letter in your mind. Now, think about a country that starts with that letter. Okay, so whatever whatever your country is. So, So everybody got a country in their mind? 
Now take the last letter of that, country, of that country, whatever the last letter is, find an animal that starts with that letter. Okay, so how many know that kangaroos don't live in Denmark? Is that what you had? Now, you're wondering if I have the word of knowledge and whether I'm prophetic. I just wanted to prove to you that I can read your mind. So I know where you live. I know who you are. And so at any rate, good. I'm glad that worked. I haven't done that one in a while. Well, today we're going to talk about sharing our faith. And um, I do believe that we're living in some of the most uh, critical, toxic times, but I think some of the most opportunistic times. And as Pastor Bruce said, I think that people are more open than ever. It's like fishing during the salmon run. You just kind of throw a hook out there and people are getting connected or getting hooked. And I believe that this is an opportunity for us as we prayed our whole lives that God would help us to reach our cities and nations for Christ. This is our hour. This is our time. And so I've labeled today this idea of the word go. And this is a word that Jesus used. It's a pretty important word. And it, it is a word that describes what you and I should be doing, not just believing, not just singing, not just praying, but doing. It's like what D.L. Moody once said. He said, Christians don't tell lies, they just sing them. This is, this, this is a really important thought that Jesus had. And I want to read a scripture to you that's kind of the springboard for where I want to go today in Mark 16, 15. Some of the last words spoken by Jesus to his people. And it says, and he told them, speaking to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And Jesus is trying to communicate something to us of what was really important to him. And when you look at this word go, it actually implies as you're going. It doesn't mean like go to a country. It means when you wake up, you're going to be going. As you go, as you go to work, as you go to the store, as you put your trash out, no matter what you're doing, as you move, as you breathe, you should be thinking about lost people. So he says, as you go, this word into actually means to come out of something, to come out of the rose-colored stained glass windows, to come out of our Christian communities, our clique, our familiarity with things, our comfort, whatever that might be. And that means to... Go into something means to come out of something. So Jesus is saying, as you're going, get out of your frame of mind, your insecurities, your fears, your anxieties, whatever it is. Go into something. And he says to go into all the world, your relatives, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. He's not necessarily meaning go into Africa, although you should go there. He's talking about your next door neighbor. He's talking about the people at the store. And he goes on to say that we should preach, meaning that we should actually proclaim something. It, it's not just enough to demonstrate something. There has to be proclamation with our demonstration. And so that's what we're going to be talking today is both sides of the coin, demonstration and proclamation. And it should be the good news. We should be telling people about Jesus. Uh, the reality is, is that lost people without the gospel in their life will spend eternity without Christ. Every time your heart beats, someone dies without Christ. In one year, 52,600,000 people will spend eternity without Christ. Today alone, 144,000 people will die and spend eternity without Christ. I mean, you just stop and you think about the magnitude of that. And you begin to realize that what Jesus was saying here was really important. And he goes on and he says this, to everyone, meaning all people everywhere. That means people that don't look like you, people that don't vote like you, people that don't live like you, people that don't have the same sexual orientation as you, everyone. And so as we look at this phrase that Jesus is talking about, it's really what today's all about. And I'm just going to talk about three sessions today. I'm going to talk about preparing yourself to go. Like, what do we need to do to prepare ourselves so that when it's time we go? Second of all, I want to talk about what it means to share the gospel. I'm going to 
help you understand once you have an opportunity in front of you, how do you share the gospel with people and how do you help them to see what it is that will save them from eternity without Christ. And last, we're going to talk about principles. Once you get into a situation, how do you effectively communicate that, the gospel to people? So those are kind of the three ideas that we're going to talk about today. But the big idea for this first session is, is this thought, and you'll see it on the screen, is that I must be ready to share the good news with anyone when the opportunity arises. I must... Be ready, not get ready, be ready to share the, when you hear that click, that's the anointing. <laughs> if you're wondering what that click is, should I use a handheld or should I just stop moving my head? Well, it's, it's, is, it, is it okay? Well, we're all right. It's all right with me. If it gets worse, you should use the handheld. Okay, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'll pull the cord out a little bit so it maybe gives some <laughs> tickles. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. I must be ready. To share the good news with anyone when the opportunity arises. And I want to begin this morning by sharing a story where I learned this lesson the hard way. I had just given my life to Christ and was a Christian for about two weeks after a very ugly, difficult, dark life. Wanted for, wanted for kidnapping, attempted murder dropped out of high school, drug addict. I get radically saved, and after two weeks, I have this opportunity to share what God was doing in my life with a coworker. His name was Dave Emmerich. It was in Lake Tahoe where I lived. It was a very cold, wintry morning. I pulled into the post office, and as I was checking my mail, I saw Dave drive in in his big F-250 truck in the parking lot. For the first time in my life, I felt the urgency or the burden to share something, and I could tell because my heart started to beat and my palms of my hands started to get a little sweaty, and I knew that there was something unique happening, that I should share with Dave about the good news. And it was also the first time that I recognized a thing called fear and intimidation in sharing my faith. Because I found myself in this quandary where I begin to reason. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe he won't like me. What if he hates me? What if he mocks me at work? What if I don't say the right thing? And in my mind quickly, I begin to reason my way out of sharing my faith with Dave. Dave walks in. Hey, Mark, how the blankety blank you doing? Hey, Dave, what's happening? We did all the small talk, and the whole time I'm just looking at him, I'm just feeling this inside. Dave would leave, I would never share. I would go home, eat dinner that night. I'd wake up the next morning, it snowed, went out to the, to the driveway to get the newspaper. I opened up the newspaper, paper, and the top of the Tahoe Tribune says this, local man drowns in lake. It was Dave Emmerich. David left, the, left, left the, the post office. I was maybe the last person that he talked to. And he would drive out to Camp Richardson. He'd walk out on a dock, get in a boat to go fix something. The boat would overturn 39 degree water, and he would die in the lake. I'll never forget what I felt when I read the header. And I remember the feeling. I began to question myself. Mark, why didn't you share? Why wasn't I ready? What do I need to do to prepare myself for the next time when the opportunity arises? And one of the scriptures that really became a benchmark scripture for me in my life ever since that tragedy was written by a guy named Peter. Peter was a guy like me entered the room first, boisterous, cantankerous guy. But he also was a guy that missed an opportunity to share the gospel three times. And Jesus says, there's going to be an opportunity, you're going to miss it, and then you're going to hear a rooster crow. And it's after this that Peter begins to write to a group of people like you and me, facing persecution and the challenges that they would face 
Peter would write these words and deliver a message of hope and purpose to some people based upon his failure, a lot like me today with you and my failures. And in 1 Peter 3.15, he says this, always, not sometimes, always be ready. Always be ready to answer everyone who asks you to explain about the hope you have. Message paraphrase says this, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way that you are. This is what Peter basically was saying. Listen, I know what it's like to miss it. I know what it's like. Every time I see that little girl in the town square, I break out in a rash. Every time I hear a rooster crow, I get uneasy. Every time I see that guy where I hacked off his ear that's a little sideways on his head, I get a little bit embarrassed that I didn't share. And so he's saying, basically, let me tell you that it's better to be prepared and useful than it is to miss God. Always be ready to give an account for the hope that lies within you. And so when I think about this word preparation, it simply means this. It means to make ready beforehand for a specific event or occasion for a purpose. And we would understand this. How many, how many ladies have ever prepared for a wedding? Don't wave at me. There's two of you have been married. That's good. Okay. You, you understand, you just didn't show up on your wedding day. It, there was, you, you saw a date, and you spent months preparing because you knew that day was coming. So therefore, you put great preparation to make sure that when that day came, that you were ready. That's preparation. When you go to school to take an exam, you study and prepare because you know the final exam is coming. When you go to a job interview, you walk through the questions because you know they're going to be asked. That's preparation. And so that's exactly what Jesus is communicating, what Peter's trying to communicate to us, is that we always need to be ready. Prepare. Why? Is because God's going to put people in your path. Today, when you leave here, God's going to put people in your path. You'll be ready or you won't. You'll be able to share or you won't. I walked downstairs this morning at 5.30 a.m. into the foyer of my hotel to get coffee. Abby was there who worked the graveyard shift. I was ready to share the gospel with someone at 5.30 in the morning. Why? Is because God put her in my path. And I prayed earlier, God, put people in my path today so that I might be able to tell them about you. We have an opportunity every day as you're going, God will put people in your path. Always be ready to give an account for the hope that lies within you. And so what I want to do is I want to just give you, I'm going to get really practical for most of the day. And I want to give you some principles, like how do you prepare yourself? Like what are some things that you can be doing to be fruitful in sharing your faith? And so here's the first thing. And again, there's, these are six simple steps. The first step is this, bridge relationships with those who need Jesus. Here's what I have found. Relationships are the primary vehicle that Jesus uses to bring people to Christ. Let me ask the question today. How many of you here came to Christ because someone knocked on your door and shared the gospel with you? A stranger knocked on your door and you got saved because they knocked on your door. Please wave at me. Look around the room. Okay, there's no hands. How many people came to Christ Because you were walking down the street and a stranger stopped you and shared the gospel. Can I see your hands? Got one. That's good, though. Kind of close. Golf course. Well, that works, too. Was it me? No, I'm just joking. So we got one. How many here 
gave their life to Christ because a relative, friend, neighbor, or coworker, someone that you knew, had an opportunity to share with you. Would you put your hands up? Now look across the room. Keep your hands up and look across the room. Why is it then that we spend all of our time in churches trying to do some kind of evangelism with strangers when God has put us in the path with our relatives, friends, and neighbors, and coworkers? 86% of all people that ever give their life to Christ come through a relative, friend, neighbor, and coworker. And there's a biblical example of that. You see, for instance, where Andrew brings his brother Simon Peter to Christ. John 1.40 says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, talking about relationship, family, was one of these men who heard what John said, and they then followed Jesus. And then Andrew went to go find his brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah. And then they go and they tell their friend Philip, and Philip then brings Nathaniel. And you can go down the list and you watch this progression of relationships where people share the faith. You look at Romans 10 with the Roman centurion, where he brings his family to Christ. You look at the Philippian jailer. He brings his family to Christ. And so there's this biblical model that shows us that we have to start first by building relationships with those that don't know Christ, meaning that you actually have to have friends with people that don't know Jesus. That's why the most fruitful time of most believers' lives are the first two years after giving their life to Christ because they still have friends with lost people. And the longer that, we, that we're in church, the more that we cut off the world and we wonder why we're ineffective, it's because we stop building relationships with friends and neighbors. And so it requires effort. It requires energy. Always be ready to give an account for the hope for those that lie within you, right? And so if we're going to be effective in sharing our faith, we need to just think about, like, how do I begin to build relationships? Like, the only way that you're ever going to get the city into your church is to get your church into the city. Let me say that again because some of you are looking confused. The only way that you're ever going to get those outside of the church inside of the church is to get the church outside of the church into the city. And again, we just think somehow people just walk by and go, hey, I just kind of felt like stopping in. Those days are over. When we look at people and their view of Christianity or Jesus or the church or you as a believer, there's a colossal disconnect. And so here's a couple things I'm just going to encourage you, and I'm just going to give you some practical ideas, like how do I build relationships, some things to think about. First of all, I would encourage you to make a list, get a journal or piece of paper, and write down the names of seven to ten relatives, neighbors, family members, or coworkers. If you can't find seven to ten, you have to really work at it. But ask the Lord to give you seven to ten people. Put them together on a list. And then focus your efforts and energy on those people because they're the most fruitful. We just built a house in a new neighborhood, a new subdivision. Everybody is new neighbors. I have actually, I call it, um, I call it neighbor bingo. I have the plot map for our entire subdivision. There's 72 homes. I already have 51 of the 72 little plot map, maps with the names on the people. I do walks every day because I'm thinking about meeting neighbors. Hey, how you doing? My name's Mark. This is my wife, Susan. I go home and I write their name down. They think I'm a stalker probably, but that's okay. I now know who they are and I know how to start building relationships with them. The guy next to me, his name's Ahmed. He's a Muslim. His wife, Florina, she's from Romania. They've already been to church three times because I'm helping them as they're building their house. I'm giving them all the tips and we're building relationships and I'm trying to be proactive If I don't take the step and identify those people and those names, I'm not going to do anything. Who are your seven to ten people? Write them down. The next thing that you could be doing is praying for them. Be aware of people that God puts in your path. Like for me, this morning, 5.30 with Abby, God put her in my path. So who is it that God puts in your path? Today, when you go to a restaurant, God, what about this one? What about the hostess? What about the... What about the person, the waitress? Like, 
God, what about this person? Do you want me to pray for them? Do you want me to encourage them? Do you want me to say something to them? You have to be thinking about the people that God puts in your path. Here's another one. If you don't have relatives, friends, neighbors, coworkers, be proactive in building relationships. Think of ways to get in front of other people. One of the things I do every, every Wednesday evening is I put my trash cans out. But I wait till I hear the, and as soon as I hear my neighbors putting their trash cans out, I say, babe, I'm going to go put the trash cans out. Why? Hey, how you doing? Jake, Lisa, it's good to see you. I think, man, why is it that every time I put my trash cans out, that guy puts his out? They'll figure it out someday. But I'm being proactive. I'm thinking this is another opportunity to just say, hey, how's your life going? How's work going? How's your new house going? How are the kids going? You know, and so I want to find ways to be around people. Same thing with a worker when they take a, a coffee break or whatever it might be. Here's another one is if you're really struggling finding friends, find common interests. What about the people at the gym? How many go work out at the gym? Three of you. New York needs some help here. Um, I, 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 I go at the same time, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday mornings, and the same people work out there. So I try to work around the same people and follow their little rhythm. Why? Because... I want to build relationship with Joe. I want to hear about his little dogs and his dog show, although he has got owns a couple rat dogs. I'm sorry. Um, but <laughs> I want to hear about his dogs, and I want to hear about his little dog show trips that he does. <laughs> that, that matters to him. It's going to matter to me. I'm going to find common interests with him, right? Um, get involved in your community. Find a way to, to serve somewhere. Get involved... Seth teaches or is a coach at a soccer league with his kids. Find ways to engage in your community. And so I just want to encourage you, the first thing that you have to think about is bridge relationships. Think about who they are. Write down 7 to 10. Put them in front of you. If you were to sit my desk at home, I've got that plot map. It sits out on my desk every day for the last year. I don't put it in a file. It sits out. I see it and it reminds me every day who those people are. When I take my walk, I remind myself the way that I'm walking, what their names are. I'm looking for those people. So are you with me? What's the first thing we need to do? Man, you guys are smart. It's good. Here's the second thing, is be an example. Once you build a relationship with people who need Christ, it's, an imp it's imperative that you are an example to them. Like, show them you're different. This, this is what Paul says, and I, I'm, I'm going to read it from the message paraphrase. He's writing to the Corinthian church that's a lot like the American church. They've been culturalized, and there's a lot of mixture, a lot of wrong behaviors. As you read his epistle, he's challenging them about some of their ungodly behaviors. So he says to them, I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything that I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it and then missing out myself. In a more biblical context, he says, he says that I put my flesh in subjection to my spirit so that when I preach the gospel, I won't be disqualified. Meaning that when I share with someone about the good news of Jesus, it validates that I'm different versus they mock me because my belief is different than my behavior. God help us. I remember hearing a story about a man named Richard Warmbrandt. Richard Warmbrandt was a pastor in Romania. He was in prison for 14 years, two different times, for preaching the gospel. And when he was put in prison, he was tortured. He wrote a book called Tortured for Christ. I would recommend it. It's a great read. In one of the occasions where he was in prison, after three years of being beaten and tortured, this event would happen that he writes about. And every day he would get up and stand up in the courtyard with 200 people in the courtyard, 
and he would preach Christ. The guards would take him and they would torture him. They would stick hot pokers in his body. They would whip him, beat him, chain him, stick him in a three foot by three foot cubicle for days. They would poison his food. And when they would let him out after three days, he would stand back up and go back right into the courtyard and say, now where did I leave off? And he would preach again and they would beat him. This would take place for three years. One day as he stood back up to preach, there was another man in the courtyard that had watched this take place. And he stood up in the midst of the audience and said, Warbrandt, there is no God. He says, look at you. Look at your body. Look at the way you've been beaten. You say there's a God. Look at you. And Warbrandt says to him, excuse me, sir. If I show you God, would you then believe? He says, of course I would, but there's no God. And he looked at him in front of the crowd and he lifted the hands that had never made a fist, his body that was scarred. And he looked at him and said, God is like me. And here was a guy that had never mocked, ridiculed, complained about the guards that had beaten him, prayed for them, loved them, served them, and preached the good news of Christ. And immediately, not only that man gave his life to Christ, but a bunch of other people in the crowd. Let me ask you this question. You're at work. Your coworkers going through a divorce. Their lives falling apart. They're desperate for answers. And they say to you, I wish I could find God. I wish I could find God. Could you say to them, God is like me. They laugh at you. They mock you. They think about the bad jokes that you told the stuff that you're looking at on your phone, your television, the way that you've ridiculed or mocked the boss, gossiped about a coworker, could you say, God is like me? This is a day and age where we live in this idea of dualism. We come in here and we sing songs and we listen to messages and we pray prayers, and we go out and live an opposite life and no longer even feel convicted about it. You allow people into your house that you'd never, through your television, that you'd never let through your front door. You look at stuff on your phones that you should never be looking at. Let's just go down the list. And we wonder why there's no power. There's no There's no ability to impact the world because we're trying to be so like the world when we're supposed to be unlike the world. So once you build relationships, the next thing you need to do is be thinking about this. How am I an example to them? So they look at your marriage. They look at the way you treat your kids. They look at the way you behave in public. We're talking about preparation, building relationships, being an example to those that are around us. Are you all right? You want to do an altar call right now? (laughs) Here's the third thing. Be aware of your enemy. The single most resisted activity on planet earth is sharing your faith. The devil will do whatever he can to keep you from sharing your faith. And he's real. He's alive on planet earth. The Bible says that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2.11, he says, do not be ignorant 
concerning the enemy's tactics. That's where you actually get the word agnostic. Do not be agnostic. Do not, do not just discount. One, like, like we forget that there's, that there's really a, another force at work beyond the kingdom of God. And it's the enemy. And he's doing everything within his power to stop you. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, and 8 and 9 says this. Stay alert. Watch out. For your great enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to to, to devour, to devour. Stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. Listen to the terminology. Stay alert. Watch out. Stand firm. Be strong. I mean, he's trying to help us understand that, listen, it's going to require some spiritual force and alertness and dependence on the Holy Spirit if you're going to be effective. We're talking about being prepared. Realize there's a real devil. And the enemy, this has been going on a long time. He has a, he has a two-fold strategy. He's been doing this a long time. We should figure it out by now. And the first thing that he wants to do to you to stop you from sharing is distract you, paralyze you. Like the first attack is just simply you. He wants to distract you. He wants to paralyze you. And his his tactics are the same since the beginning of time. There's five of them. Number one is intimidation. The number one reason why people don't share their faith is intimidation, like me with Dave Emmerich. You can be the most confident person until you feel the need to share, and all of a sudden what happens? You start feeling intimidated. Where does that come from? You're under spiritual attack. You start feeling insecure. What will they think? And how many would say that's their number one concern? Look around the room. There's people all over. When that happens, you have to realize. That's why, that's why Peter's saying, be alert. Be on alert. Be strong. Because he knows that the enemy is going to put that on you. Here's the second reason why people don't share their faith. Fear. So if it's not insecurity and intimidation, it's going to be fear. I learned this long ago. An acrostic for the word fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear's fantasy. It's a smoke screen. Now, there's real fear, like leaning over a cliff, you're going to fall a 1,000 feet. I get that. But spiritual, when the enemy puts this fear on you, like they're going to stab you in the forehead. It's just, it's not real. Like, I've never been punched in the faith for sharing my faith with other people. And I've, I've shared my faith with people tens of thousands of times. And I've never been punched in the face. It reminds me of the story of a lady. She had checked into her t- hotel, and she had her suitcase with her. And she put her suitcase down, and she heard a... And she freaked out. She says, oh, my God, there's a, there's a snake, a rattlesnake in my suitcase. She freaks out. She calls 911. They actually show up. They run into the room. They've got a fire extinguisher. <laughs> they shoot her, her suitcase. They open it up. Her electric toothbrush was on. <laughs> True story. So it is with sharing. This morning with Abby, she was so grateful, teary-eyed, that I would take the time, remember her name, talk to her, find out what's going on in her world. Invite her to church. She's been looking for something to find some answers. Dark, rainy, lonely, all night, all alone, graveyard shift. And here was a bald-headed guy that would come along and let her know. So fear. Here's the third one. Apathy or complacency. Ah, well, like me with Dave. Ah, maybe I'll get another time. Ah, it's no big deal. Ah, it doesn't matter whether they go to hell or not. Like, I got some, I'm too busy. Like, I got to go to the store. Like, I don't have time to stop for two minutes. The enemy wants to just put that in your mind, just wants you to be complacent. He can't make you bad, he'll just make you busy. He can't destroy you, he'll just distract you. Here's the fourth thing, busyness, preoccupation. Just too busy. Someone else can tell him. Or here's the fifth one. Deception. It's not my responsibility. 
it's not my gifting. Mark, that's easy for you. You've got the gift of evangelism. Even though I might have the gift, you still have the responsibility. Jesus said to all, go into the world. It doesn't say Mark, go into the world. He's talking to all of us. Here's the second strategy. Number one is to paralyze you. Number two is this. He wants to paralyze those that are far from God. He wants to put in their minds that you're hypocritical. And maybe in some cases we are. Judgmental. Out of touch with reality. There's a book I would encourage you to read. It's called Unchristian. And it talks about what the world thinks about you. It may irritate you, but it's what 80 to 90% of people think about us. We should realize that the enemy is doing a really good job at creating a spiritual DMZ zone between the church and between lost people. We just have to acknowledge the fact that that's what he's doing. And so with that, listen to what it says. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers... So they cannot see the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're blind. They can't see it. And so if we're over here doing our own thing, just all freaked out and filled with fear and intimidation, and they're over here and they can't see, we wonder why the church is in the position it is today. So we need to build relationships. We need to be an example. Then we need to be aware of the enemy. Which leads us to this next place, is that we need to fervently pray for those who need Christ. We're talking about six simple steps to prepare ourselves. When we bridge relationships, we've got their names, we're being an example to them, we're aware of the enemy, we now have to engage the most powerful force known in the kingdom of God in its intercessory prayer. I believe anytime, anywhere, anybody is ever saved, it's because someone prayed. I believe that nations are opened up because there's people that pray for a nation. I wanted to read this quote. It's by a guy named T.W. Hunt, Southern Baptist Convention. He says this. He says, the biggest single non-biblical aspect of Americans praying today is the lack of intercession for praying for the lost. And this is where American Christians fail most dismally. Like, we want to pray for me. I want to pray for my job, my money, my kids, my church. But what are we doing to activate our prayer for those who need him? Paul writes this, Colossians 4, verses 3 through 4. And again, he's writing to the Colossians because here's a guy that's being used to preach the gospel in this context. He's believing that God's going to open up some doors for him. He says this, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we might proclaim the mystery of Christ. So he's saying, Pray that doors might be open, that the gospel might go forth. James 5.16 says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we have to realize that prayer is the key to breaking the blindness off of people's lives. I cannot tell you how many times where I prayed when I hear a trash can. I'm going to go run and put my trash can out. I know it's Jake and Lisa, and I'm thinking, God, open up the door right now for me to share. And I go out there only to find out that they are more receptive, more open to talk than maybe if I didn't pray. This morning, praying, God, put someone in my path. Walk downstairs five minutes later, 5.30 a.m., and here's a lady putting coffee. Not supposed to put it out till 6 a.m. She's there at 5.30. Why? I believe it's because I prayed. I don't know what that does to your theology. For me, I choose to believe that prayer actually works. More prayer is better than less prayer. I remember hearing the story of a, a man. They called him the holy man, and he used to 
stand out on the edge of the ocean, and he would, for hours every morning, he would do his devotions and just stand as the waves came in, and he would raise his hands and pray, and people would walk by, and some would laugh at him and mock him, but he would just be out there just praying and worshiping God, and there are these high school students that walked by often and saw him and walked down to him and kind of mockingly say to him, hey, holy man, why don't you teach me to pray? And he grabbed one of these young men by the back of his hair, his ponytail, and and dragged him into the ocean and stuck his head down into the water (laughs) and held it down, and everyone's freaking out, and he's holding out. (laughs) Finally, he lets the kid go, and he goes, what'd you do that for? He says, until you want God, until you want air that bad, I can't teach you to pray. How bad do you want to see your brother, your sister, your sibling, your friend, your next door neighbor come to Christ? It's going to be measured by your prayer life. Can we, can we just go a little bit deeper since we won't play church here? Let me just ask this question. When was the last time you wept for someone that was unfair? When was the last time, think about it, your prayer life, you're going, I stopped and I felt the burden. I began to pray because I knew they were going to go to hell without me, without Christ. Like, when was that? Like, these are such simple things, but if we're going to talk about always being ready to prepare ourselves, To share the good news when the opportunity arises. We got to build relationships. We got to be an example. We got to be praying. We got to be doing these things. Realize there's an enemy. Here's some things, and and I'm going to read them quickly. I'm, I'm sorry that they're not on the screen, but. There's these five prayers that I pray. They're scriptures over my list of people. My journal, I've got these people, and I pray these five prayers over them. 2 Corinthians 4.4. And I pray this prayer. Jesus, would you bind the spirit that binds the mind of this person that doesn't believe? 2 Corinthians 4.4. Pray scriptures over them. Jesus, I bind the spirit that binds the mind of my Muslim next-door neighbor, Ahmed. In Jesus' name, open the door to his eyes. Second prayer, pray that the Lord would loose the spirit of wisdom and revelation upon them. Ephesians 1.17, I pray it every day over my, my list. Third thing I pray, pray the Lord would release the spirit of adoption over them. Romans 8.15. Next thing I pray, pray that the Lord would put labors into their path. Luke 10.2. It's interesting, he doesn't say pray for lost people. He says pray for labors because same thing in John 4. He says because the fields are white and ready for harvest, but the workers are few, few. Last thing I pray is pray that the Father would draw them, John 6, 44. I prayed for my dad for 35 years. I was raised by an atheist father. 35 years, I wake up and I pray these five prayers over his life. I remember the day I got a call that he wasn't going to make it through the day. And I remember crying and screaming out to God, like, God, you, you can't. He can't go. I, I'm not going to make it if he doesn't, he doesn't come to know you. But I used to always pray, Father, that you would draw him to you. Twelve hours before he died, he gave his life to Christ, had a radical conversion. And I believe it was the 35 years of my prayer along with my sisters, that would give us that opportunity. Here's the next one. Is meet needs of those around you. Like as you're building relationships with people, you're an example to them, you're thinking through all of this stuff, you realize there's an enemy, you're praying for them. Recognize their needs. It's interesting that Jesus met the needs of people in Scripture 
46 times before ever opening his mouth to share the gospel. The story of the Good Samaritan is one of the greatest analogies where in Luke 10, 33, it says, and he had compassion on them. Splagnizomahi. It's a Greek word that means he had his stomach, his bowels were yearning. He was feeling the pain as if it was his own. And I'm always looking for the needs. The greatest pathway to a person's heart is by meeting their needs. It gives you permission then to speak. This not only goes to the individual, but it goes for your city. People always go, well, how do you know like, how to reach people in your city? I say, God speaks the loudest through the evening news. Just turn on the TV, the devil vision, and just watch the news, and you'll see the cries of your city. I think about the different things going on in our city. I remember when there was a crisis with foster care. My wife and I adopted these two boys out of foster care. We had 50 to 100 kids that lived with us in foster care. When I saw the need, I wanted to jump in with other leaders and say, what can we do to transform the foster care situation in our city. We started to put together welcome boxes. It went to different churches. We started foster parent night out where we would have time to give respite care for parents and watch the kids so we could share the good news with them. We began to help raise up foster parents because we didn't want the people in the gay community to continue to get all of the kids. We recognized there was a need Today, Oregon is the only state in the nation, the most liberal state, and the only state that relies on the faith community to find all of the foster parents for the entire state. We created a nonprofit that's ran by the church called Embrace Oregon, every child. And they look to the church to find, recruit, train foster parents for kids. To me, that's called meeting a need. I remember when I was hearing about all of the police officers and the riots and the things going on. This would go back uh, 10 years ago. And I said, what would it look like if we started doing rest stops at our places? We have 24-hour rest stops at our church for an officer to come to an executive lounge, take off their guns, fully stocked kitchen where they can go hang out. We have over 500 officers a month that will come into our one location. Same thing at our mill plane location. Why? It's because we're meeting needs. And I have a great relationship, probably one of the best relationships with every chief, the commanders. They do all of the award ceremonies where the, the mayor and sometimes the governor, everybody comes to our church building because they know that we're a church that meets the need of law enforcement. What are the needs of the people around you? What's your need of your neighbor? What's the need? Just go meet that need. There's a single parent that lives next to you. Watch their kids. Give them some money for a night out. Find out what the need is and fill it. He had compassion on them. And last is this. Is be ready to share when the opportunity arises. I believe if you do the first five, number six will happen. You build relationships, and as you're an example, and as you realize there's an enemy, you begin to pray, and you meet needs, the opportunity will present itself. Yeah. And I, I, I want to just close this session by, by telling another story that happened two weeks after Dave Emmerich drowned, the story that I started with. Two weeks later, I was on my way to a prayer meeting, Lake Tahoe. Again, it's wintertime. It's freezing. It's cold. It's 6 a.m. in the morning. I pull into the church parking lot. I'm walking up the stairs that are covered in snow to the prayer room at the church. And as I'm walking up, I hear the Holy Spirit speak to me. And I sense that he says, there's a man across the street. Go pray for him. That's all that I heard. I turned around, and walking, it's still dark. There's a street light. It's sleet, kind of snow and rain mix. You guys living here would understand that. And there's a man walking along the walkway across the street. I felt the same thing. Heart started to beat. I began to think about whether I should go or not. And I said, I'm not going to feel that again. 
I ran down the stairs, jumped the fence, ran across the street. A man's walking towards me. I said, hey, how you doing? He just looked at me and he says, hey, my name's Mark. I said, I'm a Christian. I was walking upstairs to a prayer meeting. And I felt like God wanted me to come pray for you. Is there anything that I can pray for you? And he looked at me and he's silent. And tears welled up in his eyes and he said this to me. He goes, I've been walking around all night long. I was just getting ready to kill myself. And I prayed, Lord, if you're real, put someone in my path. I was able to lead that man to Christ. I was ready to share the gospel when an opportunity presented itself. Why? Is because I was no longer going to live with the Dave Emmerich memory in my mind. And God help me that I don't miss an opportunity again in my life. I always want to be ready and prepared to share the good news because it's worth sharing. Let me pray for you real quickly. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now. And we're asking you to just send your Holy Spirit, Lord, into our hearts, into our mind, into our spirit. Lord, you encourage us where we need to be encouraged. You challenge us where we need to be challenged. Lord, I pray that you would quicken, Lord, in the minds of every person here, there are seven to ten people. Lord, let their faces burn in their minds. Let them be thinking about how they can be an example and pray and care for and meet needs of these people. Lord, remove complacency, remove fear, remove intimidation, remove apathy. God, stir our hearts. Lord, the end result of today isn't that we had some good meeting and eat some banana nut bread downstairs, but Lord, that... Father, lost people come to Christ. And so, Father, quicken us, stir us. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus, and we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, amen. Amen. Let's do this. Um, and I know I'm going to cram a whole lot into, into the, the three hours that we have. But I want to just take a few minutes, and I'll do this a few times, to answer any questions before I go to the next session. If you do have to go to the restroom, feel free to get up, and, and I want to continue and just do the first sessions before we take a break, at, like only one or two at a time, of course. Um, any questions that you would have, something that I covered, something that you're sensing, feeling, something that was unclear, situation that you're in, you had asked a question about how to handle want to give an opportunity. Any questions, thoughts? Yeah. They are the toughest. Yeah, um, as a pastor too, I've had I've had at least one of my kids that went really sideways, um, and for me, I I I think it's important that we play the long game. God loves them more than we love them. Hebrews seven says that He is forever interceding on their behalf. So, like even when you're not thinking about them and interceding for them, He is. They're his kids more than they're our kids. And so I, I, I trust in that one thing. If I've done something to where I've been a bad example, or I feel like I've, I've ruined a testimony that invalidates my ability to speak, the first thing I'd probably do is humble myself and acknowledge that to that child. And say, so, you know, um, and I, I would want to let them know that, you know, I, I, I want to share with you some thoughts that I feel that God's put on my heart. 
and I want to ask your forgiveness about some things maybe that I've done or a lifestyle that I've lived or a season that I was in. I've not been a good example to you. Would you forgive me? I, th I think that the posture of humility and that posture to position yourself in a place to even acknowledge gives them a chance to be able to go, okay, maybe they're not a hypocrite. So I think that's the first thing. And again, you're going to have to judge how that fits into the context of where you're at. If you've had a season where you're doing a whole lot better, it still doesn't hurt to go back and say, maybe there was a season that I didn't. But I'm always looking for the opportunity. You know, I'm always asking them, like, I want to get beyond the surface level. Like, how are you doing? What's going on in your world? Even something as simple as, you know, they're having a struggle or something going on. Hey, do you mind? Can I just pray with you real quick? Pray with them. And just that one touch, you know, even if it's a minute where you just stop and pray for a need in their life. I, I still, to this day, I text my daughters all the time. How are you doing? How can daddy pray for you? I want to stay even at 42 or 41 and 38. Like, I always just want, I still want to be, you know, their daddy. And how can I stay close to them? And my one daughter's getting ready to go into a very difficult surgery. And so I'm just calling, how you doing, baby? I love you so much. I'm thinking about you. And so um, it's really important, I think, to, to, to look for opportunities when there's a need, when there's a crisis, when they're having a tough day. It's not where you're going and, you know, reading seven chapters of the Bible to them. But is there just a thought? Just want to let you know I'm thinking about you. I love you so much and I'm praying for you. And find those little little moments where you can, you know, share with them. So I think there's other things. You know, Mother's Day is a great thing. Hey, we just love for you to come over. We come to church with us. We want to do a big brunch afterwards. And you try to find other ways, you know, to just create opportunities. You know. So, uh, but I think the biggest thing is pray for them. I pray for my kids every day. I pray for, for every single day. I'm praying for my kids. My grandkids, you know, 20, 18, 17, and 14. God, keep them from keep them from falling away from you. God, help them to have a firsthand revelation of you. I take them on trips with me, you know, and every one of my grandkids, I take them when they graduate from high school a week, anywhere in the world they want with me and my wife. Just I just want to go spend time with them and just tell them at that crucial time of their life, listen, here's what you're going to go face. Here's where I'm at in your life. I'm here for you. How can I help you? So I want to be engaged in their life. Not just when they need it, but, you know, to, to just keep that relationship strong and that respect strong. So, does that help? One or two more questions? In the back. Um, I, I have one, I'm just going to give you one phrase I use just about everywhere that I go. I'm, I'm always, and again, we can talk about it a little bit, but I, I'm always trying to find some kind of common interest, idea, thought. I'm always using open-ended questions because I'm trying to find something that's a hook. Um, and the one thing that I usually will ask a waitress or someone is this one question. If you could ask God to do one miracle in your life, what would it be? Sometimes people go, oh, I'm praying for world peace. No, I'm saying I'm talking about you. Relationship, and I just throw out some stuff. Relationship, a financial is issue, health issue, crisis, something going on in your world, if you could just ask God for one miracle, what would you ask for? 99 out of 100 times, someone says something. And then I say, would you mind if we pray for that right now? 99 out of 100 times, they say, I would like that, even in a restaurant. And I pray for them. I think prayers are the universal language. Even though most people or a lot of people don't follow Christ, they still pray. It's the statistics show that 84% of people still pray at least one time a week. So 
So it's a universal language. That, that would be one thing that I use all the time. Um, other things is I'm just always trying to throw out different words. You know, I'm in a hotel, which I travel a lot, and I just, people say, oh, why are you here? I'm just, I'm just here. I'm sp actually speaking at a church down the road. It's, new, it's NTC. Have you ever heard of the church? Ah, no, I kind of drove by. Well, do you go to church, right? They're going to either start a conversation or not. No, I've kind of been looking so I could take another step. No, I'm not really into church and it's busy, so I just realized that I'm going to continue to ask questions and see if the door opens or whether there's a hook or not. And then I can continue that conversation on. And I'll do that with, I do that all the time. Tell me about your family. Hey, how long you've been working here? How long you live in the area? This morning, I'm asking the lady about her tattoo at the, at the, the place. I'm trying to open a door. Tell me the story about your tattoo. And she goes, oh, well, it's kind of unique. And she wants to talk about the lines. And I could tell at that moment, she was busy, turned her back a little bit, and the door wasn't open, but I still tried. I still was given an opportunity because a lot of times, even with a tattoo, people are going to tell the story about a pain or a hurt. I'm going to try to use that as an opportunity to try to take that conversation somewhere. So, and again, it's, which we'll talk a little bit about in this, this session, it just takes practice and time, you know, just trying to engage with people and Pardon me? Yeah, we'll actually talk about that in this session, okay. which is really a um, something of the past that I still believe in, you know, church invites and those kinds of things that we'll talk about. So we can come back to that. So let's do this. I'm going to jump into the next session. And this next session is entitled Sharing the Go Message. Sharing the Go Message. That's awesome. And so, again, I'm trying to walk you through sequentially. Let's start, first of all, by recognizing the first thing is that we need to prepare ourselves for when the opportunity arises that we might be able to share the gospel. And um, over the years, I've literally have had hundreds of opportunities to lead people to Christ. I've led perhaps thousands of people to Christ over my almost 40 years of being a believer. Um, leading people to Christ didn't always, it wasn't always that easy. And I likened sharing my faith with people a lot like learning how to ride a bike. And I remember early on when I had my first bike, it had training wheels on it. And I can still remember vividly the day where my dad chose to take the wheels off and he was going to run behind me and hold on to the little sissy bar on the back and help me learn how to ride without training wheels. And it was really awkward. I was filled with fear. We're running along, and all of a sudden I turn around and I realize that he's not behind me, and I'm riding solo. The only bummer to that story is, is that we lived on a hill, and I begin to go down a hill, and he never taught me how to use my brakes by pushing the pedal backwards. I ended up going to the back of a parked car. And if you look at our Christmas pictures that year, you'll see my face is all scabbed on one side because of my bike experience. My witnessing experiences early on were a lot like that. <laughs> but I got back up on my bike, and I learned to ride, and I became pretty good at it. It's the same thing with evangelism. You, 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 you have to practice, you have to practice, you have to practice. You learn through your conversations. You learn from Dave Emmerich what happens when you don't share. You learn from the guy that I led to Christ in the snow across the street what happens when you do share. And so there's practice that needs to take place. And there's all different kinds of evangelism approaches. There's public witnessing. Most people aren't called to that. I don't mind that. I'll go talk to anybody. My wife tells me um, that... There's no such things as strangers. They're just friends I've not met yet. She asked me to promise her if we're going out on a date that I would at least focus on her and not go talk to people <laughs> because I just love to share with people. So that's not everybody. I get that. But relational evangelism, meeting needs, servant evangelism, there's spirit-led evangelism, there's prayer evangelism, there's all different kinds regardless of how God wired you. 
there's still going to come the time where God's going to open up the opportunity and now you have to share your faith. You've got to be able to share the gospel to where people get saved. For years, I traveled with a ministry called Christian Equippers International. I traveled about 200 days a year equipping people in evangelism at a very young age. Had this privilege of just seeing, seeing the world and all different kinds of people. But we used to do this survey. And we would ask audiences like yours to fill out a little questionnaire. The first question was, in 50 words or less, write down your definition of the gospel. 50% of all Christians could not adequately define the gospel, including pastors. Furthermore, the question, how then would you share that, 80% didn't know how to share it even though they could define it. And so what I want to do is I want to help you and give you some thoughts about how to share the gospel. And I'm going to give you some simple tools so that when the opportunity presents itself, you can lead people to Christ. How many think that's a good idea? So there's a guy, his name's John Wesley. He was uh, one of the co-founders of the Methodist Church. He made a profound statement a few centuries ago. He said, Christians should not preach the gospel until the hearts of the unbeliever are ready to receive it. That's an interesting statement. He's saying, don't share until their hearts are received. He went on and he said this, the gospel is good seed, yet the heart of the believer is often hard. And unless you plow the ground of the heart, the seed will fall on bad soil. Jesus talked about that in the parable of the sower, Luke 8, 4 through 15. Driving here, we drove, drove through, drove is the Greek word for drove. We drove through all of these fields. He's, he's a Greek theologian, he gets it. Um, driving through all of the fields, and what's taking place is that they plowed the hardened ground because the, and they spend tens of thousands of dollars on equipment and thousands of hours before they'll even drop a seed in the ground. Why? Because they know if the ground's not plowed, the seed won't take. This is what John Wesley was saying. Charles Finney, upstate New York, obviously, if you drive through a night in New York, one of the greatest revivals of all time, he was preaching at a meeting and one young man came running forward, wanting to give his life to Christ. And Charles Finney said to the entire audience with this man looking, he says, young man, go back to your seat. You've not heard enough yet. And he sent him back to his seat because he knew that he had not yet worked hard enough in presenting to the crowd about what it meant to have a broken heart. And so this is, this is what Was, uh, Was, Wesley preached, is this. The law of God is the tool to use to break up men's hearts. I'm going to say it again. The law of God is the tool you use to break up men's hearts. When you look at the Old Testament, there's 613 laws. We all know the Ten Commandments, or at least a few of them. They all start with this idea, thou shalt not. And somewhere along the line, we believe that the law of God was given to man as a standard to live by. That's not the case. God brought the law to us to show us our inability to live up to God's standards. Follow me. This is really important. Is that somehow we think, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus says, but I say unto you, if you even look on a woman, You've committed adultery in your heart. And every man says, I'm out. 
and you go through every one of those laws, and what Jesus is trying to communicate is that you're incapable to meet God's perfect standards. And the more that you see your inability to meet God's standards, the more that you see your desperate need for a Savior. Because if you fall short of that standard, you are eternally separated from God, and you had better find a solution, and it's not you. And so this is what Wesley was trying to help us understand, is that the law produces a sense of our desperate need for the gospel. The reason why people say, well, I don't really need God, is because they think they're basically good. Paul writes to the Galatians, and he says this in verse 24 of chapter 3. He says, therefore, the law has become our tutor. It's the Greek word pedagogus, and it means guardian or instructor. The law of God is like if you have someone in school that is like a, a guardian or an instructor. It's, it, the law is the tutor. It's the guardian that leads us to the gospel. And so when we read the law and we recognize God's perfect standards, the law leads us to a place where we need Christ. And what the law does is this. It shows you the contrast between God's holiness and man's sinfulness. What's interesting, in every religion other than Christianity, God is reduced to a lower level in regards to his uniqueness and identity, and mankind is raised in regards. Man's basically good. The reason they do that, because they've got to create a culture in which man can bridge himself to God, where Christianity creates an immeasurable gap that only Christ can bridge. And so Charles Finney, in his book, Reflections on Revival, he makes this statement, and it's a lengthy statement that I want to read to you that I want to springboard off of. He says this, he said, we should present to their minds, speaking about us as believers to Christians, the character of God, his government, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the plans for salvation. Any such thing that is to calculate to charm the sinner away from his sins and, per and from pursuing his own interests, and that is calculated to excite him to exercise disinterested unselfish, and universal love. Charles Finney says, if you're going to preach the gospel, the first thing that you should focus on is the character of God. Start by talking about all-powerful, all-knowing God. He comes back and he says this. On the other hand, now speaking about man's sinfulness, focus on his own deformity, selfishness, self-will, pride, ambition, enmity, lusts, Guilt, loathsomeness, hatefulness, spiritual death, dependence, its nature and its extents. And he says, all of these things should be brought to a burning focus on his mind. God, man. God, man. God, man. God, man. God, man. God's perfection, man's sinfulness. Present them to the unbeliever to where it creates a burning focus where he begins to see his desperate need for God. He goes on and he says this, right over against his own selfishness, enmity, self-will, and loathsome depravity should be sent the disinterestedness, unselfish, great love, infinite compassion, meekness, condescension, purity, wholeness, truthfulness and justice of the blessed God. Listen to this statement. These should be held before him like a mirror. These should be held before him like a mirror until they press on him with such mountain weight as to break his heart. The mirror is like the law. It doesn't fix 
the problem. It exposes the problem. Most of you woke up this morning and you looked in the mirror. And you realized this thing needed a little help. Some of you looked in the mirror for an hour. Why? Is because it exposed the problem. The mirror didn't fix your problem. It exposed it. So you continued to focus until you got it right. Charles Finney is saying that the mirror, the law, is what you use to continually press on their minds that they need something else to fix them. And really, this is what he's saying. If you're going to, especially in this day and age, if you're going to help people come to Christ, get them to understand the problem. If they don't understand the problem, they don't care about the solution. And what we want to do is we as Christians want to constantly talk about the solution. We want to talk about Jesus. You need Jesus. Why don't you come to my church? And we begin to take a solution-based approach and wonder why nobody is ever interested. They don't think they're lost. Therefore, why should they get saved? Let me use an analogy. Let's say that we're all on an airplane and we're going to go on vacation somewhere. How many want to go on vacation right now? Get out of the rain. Come on, wave at me. Where do you want to go? Someone name something. Hawaii. Hawaii, Caribbean. Hawaii. Pastor Frank says Hawaii. We're going to Hawaii. How many want to go? Bah, 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 bah. So we're going to Hawaii. I'm the flight attendant. So I'm the one that's going to serve you all of the snacks and everything else. You're all excited. You've got your seatbelts on. We take off. We're 10,000 feet. I hear a ding. I pick up the phone. The pilot tells me to go into the cockpit. He wants to talk to me. So I go into the cockpit, and I get with the pilot, and his face is white. The assistant pilot, his face is white, and he looks at me and he says, they forgot to put gas in the plane. We're all going to die. Like we're, we're 1,000 miles over the, the, the Pacific Ocean. There's no turning back. There's no hope. You don't know there's a problem. I do. So I come out of the cockpit, and I look down, and I see three parachutes. I put one on. I might be selfish, but I'm definitely not stupid. I put a parachute on. And so I've got these two parachutes in my hand, and I'm going to now start to communicate to you what's going on. And so my first parachute... I walk up to someone, and I just want to talk to them about the solution. Hey, how you doing today? You doing great? That's great. Hey, listen, my name's Mark. I'm the flight attendant here, and I think you've noticed that I've got a parachute on. Listen, I belong to this parachute club. We meet every Sunday. We sing songs about parachutes. This guy preaches about parachutes. I belong to a small group that talks about parachutes. And I want to let you know that if, if you take this parachute and put it on, your life's going to be like mine. There'll never be any problems. You'll be happy. Everything will be cold. Do you want a parachute? She's going, that's kind of weird. Like, right, if you saw someone walking down the airplane with a parachute on, that's kind of weird. So I said, why don't you put this parachute on? She goes, well, I really don't want that parachute. You know, it says, no, I know it looks a little awkward and stuff like that, but you need this. She goes, I don't want that. Put the parachute on. So she puts the parachute on. Okay? She has been presented a solution, but she doesn't understand the problem. So I go over to the next guy. Of course, it's going to be Pastor Don. <laughs> hey, get that parachute back on. See, she's already taken it off. That's like people that don't understand the problem. She, I don't need that thing. Like, I tried, I tried church for two weeks. It didn't work for me. That guy told me my life would be wonderful, and it's falling apart now. That didn't work already got her parachute on. Keep that thing on. <laughs> so a different approach. Hey, buddy. Um, 
question isn't what's up. Things question is like what's going down. <laughs> I got some bad news. I was just up with the pilot. He told me we're gonna run out of gas and die. Ah! He screams. <laughs> John, listen. There's no way out. We're a thousand miles out over the Pacific Ocean. There's no hope. You understand there's a problem? Like 90 seconds from right now, you're going to die. It's a bummer, isn't it? But hey, hey, listen. Listen. I've got a parachute. Put it on. So all of a sudden, you guys realize there's a couple people wearing parachutes. Because you don't know the problem, like the world, you begin to mock these two. You look at her. Oh, you're one of those parachute thumpers, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I know all about you. You think you're like, you're so critical. You think you're better than the... And the more that you put pressure on her, the more that she says, wait a minute, that guy told me that my life would be better, and it's not. She gets rid of the parachute. Why? She never understood the problem. You start putting pressure on him. Ah, oh, look at you. You think you're so good, Mr. Curry. You think you're so good. The more that you mock him, the tighter he holds his parachute. And in about five seconds from now, the plane's going, amp, amp. He opens up the door and he says, mock on. <laughs> Why? He understands the problem. Charles Finney said, John Wesley said, the law of God is the tutor that we use to break men's hearts. If they don't understand the problem, the problem, the problem, they'll never go for the solution. So there's really four things that we need to present to people, and it's this simple. In sharing the gospel, when you get the opportunity to use this, are these four things. God, man, problem, solution. God, man, problem, solution. Say it with me. Come on. God, man, Problem, solution. Almost sounds like lions or tigers or bears, so am I. Lions or tigers or bears, so am I. God, man, problem, solution. God, man, problem, solution. We just got to remember that. If you're going to preach the gospel, you use those four components. The first thing you do, as Finney said, and as Wesley pointed out, Focus on the character of God. And you'll see this on the screen here. Is that God's character, explain it in detail. Make God big. I can't go through all of this in detail. I'm sure Pastor Bruce and Pastor Don and Pastor everybody here will give you all of these notes. Focus on God. God is good. God is big. God is holy. God's righteousness. God's unable to lie. God is love. Focus on God. People have a lesser reality of who God really is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Focus on God. I ask the question, what words would you use to describe God? I don't tell them. I ask them. Wow, God's a tree. God's a flea. God's a bee. God's me. I live in Portland, so I hear that a lot. You know, my God is a tree. I go hug trees on Sundays. Let me know how that works for you, you know, but... I was witnessing to one guy at the gym, and he says, I'm just still trying to fabricate my definition of God. And I says, well, let me know when you got it figured out. I'd love to have the conversation. Talk about who God is. The second thing is talk about man. You've got to create this gap. Man falls short. Man's not basically good. Our hearts are deceitfully wicked above all things. Left our own demise, we self-destruct. Like, even right now, it's really easy in our godless society 
we're watching our nation implode before our eyes because the sinfulness of man, what just took place in Texas with the 18, what just took place in Buffalo. I mean, let's just go down. Like, those are great current events. Like, like, what do you think was going on in that young man's mind? Like, let's talk about Texas. There's a great intro to a gospel conversation about the sinfulness of mankind. Like, do you think it's just that young boy? Well, it's a buffalo, and then, like, our world's going mad. What's wrong with man? Right. Let's talk about the heart of man. Right. Man, we're going crazy. The world's upside down. It's whacked out. It's a great starting point. When you present God, man, problem, solution, God, man, problem, solution, when you show those two, you've got to get people to understand that there's a problem is that we fall short of God's standards. And we've got to understand, listen, if you don't fix the problem, if you don't find the solution, there's no hope for you. And we've got to talk about what that problem represents. And I will spend more time on this part of a gospel presentation more than any other part of the conversation. I want to make sure that they understand the problem. There's many times where I've had conversations with people and the conversation comes to an end and I say, I would love to continue the conversation and I won't even talk about the solution because I don't feel that they're at a place where the mirror has revealed to them their condition. I do not see that it's pushed on them with such mountain weight as to break their heart. I want to see like they're desperate. They need help. Because if they don't understand the problem, the solution means nothing. And I hear all different kinds of excuses. Like I hear this one all the time. Well, I'm not that bad. I've, I, I've not really done that many wrong things. Right? They're grading on the curve. I, I love saying to people, oh, man, thank you for being such a good person. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. Like, how many times does it take to rob a bank to be a bank robber? Ah, uh, one time. Well, how many times does it take to murder someone to be a murderer? Uh, one time. How many times does it take to sin then to be a sinner? Uh, one time. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. It's eternal separation from God. So even though you are a good person, thank you, because of your sin, you fall short of the perfection of God. They might come back and say, well, hey, listen, I'm really sorry then for what I've done. Like I have people all, all the time say, I'm really sorry. Even being sorry is not good enough. Like, I'm, I'm kind of sorry for what I've done. It's just like, it's like, let's say that you never sinned for your whole life. You're 90 years old. And you just go out and maybe just a little senile and you shoot someone. You're going to stand before the judge and you're going to go, hey, I've got 90 years. Would you just let me go this time? Like, sorry's not good enough. What, what's missing? Penalty, punishment. Now, there may be a more lenient, but the reality is, is they're not, you know, hey, just I know you're a good person. We'll just let you off this time. Just, just don't shoot anymore. <laughs> right? How about this one? I'm basically a good person. I hear this all the time. And what happens is we want to judge ourselves based upon other people around us. And so we can always find someone better than us, and we don't want to find people Excuse me, we always can find someone worse than us, but we rarely want to point out the people that are better than us because we want to make ourselves feel good. So let's say we're living in a neighborhood. You got two neighbors. One's Charlie Manson, lives on the left side. Old Chuck's out mowing the lawn. And on the right side's old Mother Teresa. You know, you begin to compare yourself. Yeah, well, you know, my next door neighbor, Chuck over here, man, he's just like an ax murderer, you know, and I'm so good. <laughs> it makes you feel good. But what about Mother Teresa? You don't look so good. 
And the reality is we can always find someone a little bit better than ourselves and someone a little bit worse than ourselves. But the reality is even Mother Teresa, without Christ, falls short. So I want to make sure when I'm talking about the problem, it's just like the problem, the problem, the problem. Whatever excuse they have, I'm trying to mine out, like, what is it that's, that's thinking that you can do something that gets you into a place where you're going to find salvation outside of Christ. And finally, when you get to someone saying, you know what? Like, man, I, like, what's the answer? Like, I, like you, you, can, you can tell when you get someone to that place where they're just going like, I'm desperate. It's then and only then that you should be talking about the solution. And the solution is that God devised a plan that placed the death penalty upon the only person who could take man's place, and that's Jesus himself. And we can go through and talk about Jesus paying the price for our sins. He was 100% man, became 100% God, or vice versa. And he remained sinless, and he's the only one that could pay the price. People often say, well, you know, if God was so loving, why would he send man to hell? God doesn't send man to hell. Man sends themselves to hell. He already paid the price. So you have a choice now whether you want to accept or deny. There's two ways to pay your penalty. I tell people this all the time. Like, you get to choose. Like, you can pay the price, or you can accept the fact that Jesus already paid the price. The choice is yours. But there is a solution. There is a way out. And I want to make sure that people understand what that way is out. And ultimately, when you get there, you find that there's many people today that ultimately then will want to give their life to Christ because they see that Jesus is the only way to salvation. So we're to prepare ourselves. And when the opportunity presents itself, we want to be able to share God, man, Problem, solution. God, man, problem. <coughs> Amen? Amen? Questions? I'm going to take a break in a second here. Questions about the gospel, circumstances, objections. Um, that would be an often conversation in Portland, Oregon, uh, one of the most godless, unchurched areas. Without complicating our conversation, in order to even get where there's a God, I often start with the idea, is there anything as truth? Because we live in a society today that, that even debates whether there's such things as absolute truth. So I want to start, first of all, like, is there such thing as absolute truth? Wow, well, no. You know, I help them understand laws of God, laws of nature. You know, well, I don't believe, you know, it's, truth is what you make it. I said, well, why don't you go up onto the building? I'll stand down here five stores. Why don't you jump and tell me if that law of gravity is relative? Like when you splat, that's called absolute truth. Like you can't defy that. So there's laws of nature. There's laws of man, there's laws of God. And even people say, well, you know, how can you prove truth? I want to get from truth to the idea that the Bible is infallible truth. So I want to have a conversation with someone saying, well, I don't believe there's truth. I said, well, if I could prove to you that the Bible is infallible truth, would you then believe? Yeah, I guess I'd have to, but you can't do that. The question is that if I could, would you then believe? And there's a great book out called The Book of Books that talks about the 14 divine acid tests of how you can prove through scientific accuracy, archaeological accuracy, historical accuracy, the law of compound probabilities when it comes to prof prophetic accuracy. And you can go through using their scientific, non-god, you know, godless mind to prove that the Bible's infallible. We could do a whole session just on that. 
And there's times I'll sit down and just talk to them about that and say, let's just talk about that. that let's just talk about the law of compound probability. Like, like let's talk about the idea of, of prophecy in the Bible regarding messianic prophecies. And let's just recognize that, let's just say that there was someone that was able to prophesy eight things that would take place in the future in exact, perfect, detailed order. That'd be 10 to the 17th power. In order to understand the magnitude of that, you would have to fill the state of Texas two feet deep in pickles or silver dollars. Put a little red dot on a silver dollar, blindfold someone, put them in a helicopter, fly them over the vast plains of Texas, and somewhere along the line they say, land the helicopter here. They stick their hand down in those <coughs> coins and they get one chance to pick the one coin with the red dot. That's the odds of fulfilling eight prophecies in exact perfect detailed order, 10 to the 17th power. I've shared that with people. They go, well, that could happen. I said, you're right, that could happen. <laughs> so let's, 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 let's just say 16 prophecies, 10 to the 40th power. That's like taking a ball of McDonald pickles 186 million mile of pickles. Take the distance to the sun times two and make it a ball of pickles. And squirt ketchup on one pickle and get in your space shuttle and go around the ball of pickles and you stop about 45 million miles around and then you want to drill in about 136 million miles and turn right and go 3 million miles and up 1 million and say, here's the pickle. That's the odds of fulfilling 16 prophecies in exact perfect detail. Well, that could happen. So let's talk about 40 prophecies, 10 to the 157th power. That's like taking a cubic inch of electrons. Just to count a lineal inch of electrons, you'd have to count 250 per minute for 19 million years to count the electrons in a lineal inch. And let's cube that. 19 million years times 19 million years times 19 million years <laughs> and mark one electron and go find that one. That's fulfilling 40 prophecies in exact perfect detail. order. Jesus fulfilled 332 prophecies in exact perfect detailed order. It's beyond mathematics. So that would be one example of how I can say, this is why I believe the Bible to be true. We could talk about scientific and archaeology and all that kind of stuff. And so if I can get someone long answer to a very short question, that there's a place that I can get them to to say that the Bible's infallible. If I can prove this to be true, would you then believe what it says? When you get them there, okay, now let's say what now this says. We just proved it to be true. This is what now this infallible word says about God, that there is a God and this is who he is, right? And so it's really important to walk them through that stuff. One more question, we're going to take a break. Yes. If you look in time, you come back. Um, once again, um, you've got to take them back to what God says about them. <coughs> and so people think that they're, it's one of the most, e it, it's one of the easiest conversations because they don't want God to be mad at them. They feel condemned. They feel shame, they feel regret, they feel isolated. And so I would find those scriptures that talk about how much God loves them, that he'll never leave or forsake them, that you can cast your cares on him because he cares for you. His yoke is easy, his burden is light, and that his, his mercy, you know, is unending, his unfailing love. And I would find those scriptures to help them understand this isn't what God thinks about you. And probably something's happened in their life, whether it's a father figure or another abusive leadership figure or 
past abusive pastor figure or wrong teaching that has put that frame in their mind. I would want to dismantle that. I don't want to dismantle it to the place where they don't understand that there's a consequence if they're far from him. He loves them so much that he was willing to die for them. That's the greatest gospel message is all. God's mad at me. No, God, if you're the only person on planet Earth, he loved you so much, John 3, 16, that he would send his only son to die for you. He's not mad at you. He just wants a relationship with you. And he did whatever it took to make sure that there would be a pathway for you to be loved by him, reconciled to him, and have an eternal relationship and spend eternity. And just going, wow, like how do I find that God? Yeah. One other question? Yeah, in the back. What about some people that you think are the biggest Christians and the truest ones and they feel like they can prove it by their behavior or their actions? What are some people that you think that they feel like they can prove it and they just can't prove it by their behavior? I'd say, who wrote your auto manual? Like, so you're. Does that now invalidate the fact that when you need your brakes fixed and you pull it out and you follow the instructions that they're invalid? So obviously there's stuff that's written by man, even in the natural that we validate and use. Our medical journals. There's a lot of stuff. Our English, our textbooks in school. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that man writes that's important. What makes the word of God different is that it was inspired by God. And I come back to my conversation and saying that even though it may have been written by man, it was really written by God. Man was the instrument. Man wasn't the creator. They were the pen. He was the, he was the creator. And let me go back to my illustration to prove that the Bible is infallible. Like it doesn't matter whether God wrote it or your dog wrote it, if I can prove it to be infallible. Let's, let's lose that excuse and say, a Martian wrote it. Who cares? If it's infallible and 100% true based on these criteria, would you believe regardless of who wrote it? And I would take them back again, scientific, historic, archaeological, and I would want to walk them through to where they just go, there comes a point where someone goes, well, I still don't believe. And I'm just going, let me know how it works for you. <laughs> like I'm here for you. Like after pickles and silver dollars and electrons and you still don't get it. It's just like, I can't help you. I can still pray for them and love them and serve them and meet their needs and build relationship with them and stay with them because usually people come to Christ when there's a crisis in their life, not just from an apologetic approach. So that person being so hard has not hit a crisis big enough to where they're just going, I need something in my life. And that time will come and because I have a relationship with them, when they fall apart, you're there. My dad, he, he, he told me for 35 years, he was the godliest atheist I'd ever met. He put men on the moon. He was, a, he was a very intelligent species. And he told me his entire life that he would never believe in my God until he's 12 hours from his death. And he's facing eternity. Everything changed. 11.04? Do I dare take a break? Is it okay? Can we do... If, if we do it, because I, I, how many want to be done by noon? Okay, two of you, good. <laughs> I was told I had to be done by noon. Can we do five minutes? Just if you want to stretch, you have to go to the bathroom, come back. We'll do one session. It's 11.04. I'm going to start at 11.10. I promise to have you back by, or done by noon if you're, if you're back by 11.10. We'll start with or without you. There's cameras going in the back. We know who you are.